Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dhruva Jayashankar, uh, and I'm Executive Director of ORF America. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you today uh, for this all-star panel discussion. Um, ORF America is now two years old, and in some ways, it's a bit of a representation of the world we are now living in. As an affiliate of ORF, we represent the first uh, Indian-associated public policy institute abroad. Uh, in some ways, a natural manifestation of India stepping out into a wider world. We're also perhaps the only developing country affiliated think tank in Washington, and that is in many ways reflected in the issues we work on, including energy transitions and climate finance, economic development, and digital technology and cyber capacity in the developing world. This year, ORF America produced over 40 publications and organized almost 30 events in nine countries on five continents. It's an ambitious agenda for a young institution. And next year, we'll see us doing much more, especially around India's G20 presidency. But today's conversation featuring members of ORF America's board of directors and the global advisory board of ORF, both of whom we'll be meeting tomorrow, is on the changing geopolitical context. The world is seeing new geographic and topical fault lines emerge and new uh, challenges from within, but also new solutions on the horizon. In a small way, we at ORF America have tried to inform and shape policymakers and the public's understanding of these shifting currents. Earlier this year, ORF America organized a fellowship program at the Expo 2020 in Dubai where we convened almost 40 young entrepreneurs from 19 countries in the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia, from Morocco to Sri Lanka. With the war in Ukraine, we co-organized uh, conferences in Sweden and India that brought together policymakers from Europe, India, and the United States to discuss and debate shared concerns. And with rising tensions in the Indo-Pacific, we highlighted the partnership amongst the Quad countries and convened officials from the US government and Congress to inform cooperation under that umbrella. We have much more planned for the next year along these lines, including on the I2U2 partnership involving India, Israel, the UAE, and US, the Quad, and the Global South. Without further ado, I would like to extend my thanks and welcome to our panelists, for, former Prime Ministers of Canada and Sweden, uh, Stephen Harper and Carl Bildt, uh, former Australian Foreign and Defence Minister, Maurice Payne, and uh, Dr. Ebtisam uh, Al-Ketbi, founder of the Emirates Policy Centre. Moderating their discussion, we have uh, Dr. Samir Saran, President of the Observer Research Foundation in India and Chair of the Board Executive Committee of ORF America. But before I turn to the panel, I'd also like to introduce uh, one other guest, uh, uh, Jane Hol uh, Lute, who is a former Deputy Secretary of uh, Homeland Security, uh, also former Assistant Secretary uh, uh, at the um, United Nations as well, uh, to uh, have a few introductory remarks. Thank you. Thanks very much and welcome everyone. Um, it's really a privilege to, to welcome you all to this panel, which will be, I know, fascinating and a real opportunity uh, to hear from experts about what we can expect in 2023. And no doubt they will dive into the details of whether it's the war in Ukraine or China's effort to create an alternative global order uh, to the one that's been dominated by the West of the rise of nationalism globally or any one of a number of other issues that will be or feel pressing down on the brow of policymakers around the world. But I just want to set the stage by asking a strategic question, because in my lifetime, there have been four strategic questions that have really shaped not only U.S. foreign policy, but I think global developments in an important way. That first question was in the wake of World War II. Uh, when countries looked around and said, my goodness, how do we prevent World War III? And that was the dominant and an animating question for a number of years and led to the rise of international institutions, treaties and habits of interaction uh, that helped she shepherd in decolonialization and other major movements around the world. The second strategic question uh, became very clear with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, when, and it was obvious that the only thing standing between ourselves and the destruction of the planet was our judgment. And that question was, how do we prevent nuclear annihilation in this environment? And over the course of the Cold War, that was the major strategic dialogue that conditioned a lot, not only of superpower interaction, but of actions among others around the world as well. 
The third strategic question was brought in with the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the former Soviet Union um, and the end of the East-West antagonism as we had known it over the course of those 30 odd, 40 odd, 50 odd years. And it became very, very clear that the United States, was it a unipolar moment or what? But it was very clear that the United States from a military point of view was that much more powerful than anyone else. And the dominant strategic question through the 90s into the early 2000s was, what in the world will the United States do with this power? Some think that 9-11 and the US invasion of Iraq answered that question very clearly. Um, but it did usher in the fourth strategic question that I think is dominating certainly conversations in Washington uh, and in the transatlantic partnership as well. And that question is how fragile is the American commitment to democratic values? That question is being asked at home and as the US um, uh, far, follows its foreign policy interests around the world. So that question was answered with the recent US elections. Other things we have to wait till 2024 to find out if there is a definitive answer to that question. So my question to the panel as you undertake not only the things that we'd like to say is what's the next strategic question uh, that will guide international relations, guide the major powers and guide all the rest of us as we look into the future. So thank you again for coming and let me hand it over to Samir. Thank you, Jane. I think that's uh, a wonderful scene setter. Uh, and maybe just to uh, problematize what uh, Jane has just laid out for all of us, have any of those questions been answered yet? And I think that's, the, that's possibly the big question for 2023. Can we prevent world war? Can we prevent nuclear annihilation? Is America committed to liberalism at home and abroad? And uh, does it use its power judiciously? I think those are the big four questions from the past. But if we were to broaden it to uh, and make it more specific to uh, the, the recent uh, year that's just gone by, uh, my question to you, Prime Minister Hop, to kick it off would be that what are your pain points? What, are, what worries you with what has happened? Uh, what in some sense also gives you hope uh, as a response to all that has happened. Boy, uh, those are big questions. First of all, thanks for having me and congratulations on two years of ORF America. Um, you and I talked a number of years ago about the real possibility, real potential of ORF as a uh, global think tank from India, which is a really interesting place in the future to, to build this kind of an organization. Congratulations on the great progress you've made. So um, what uh, say? What worries me, what gives me hope? Um, well, look, I think first of all, biggest single thing that happened in 2022 by far, in fact, I think it is of immense historical significance is the Russian invasion, essentially the, the failed Russian invasion of Ukraine, which I think has ended what I call the era of naive globalism. What I mean by that is an assumption that had gradually developed in diplomatic and commercial circles at the end of, from the end of the Cold War, that the differences in political systems and the rivalries between them was a negligible mm -hmm. and declining risk. And we now know that that was not only wrong, it was foolish. And we are now as a consequence into a new kind of a Cold War. Um, and that is, that is, it starts with these, the invasion and now the immediate consequence, the permanent um, decoupling of the Russian Western economies and diplomatic circles and everything else. And that's a long-term, it's a long-term development that everyone else will start to have to position around. Uh, let me point to two big things that give me hope. One about humanity broadly. Um, I continue to believe that there's a momentum of technological innovation mm -hmm. that is unstoppable and immense and is going to make uh, enormous changes in human life that are, challenges will come with it, but for the most part are wonderful improvements. Um, you know, the one I point to, people say, what are you talking about? The one I point to staring us right in the face, how did we end the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, how do we manage through the pandemic was through the incredible advance we had in the past 15 years in, in, in 
and video conferencing. 15 years ago when I was first prime minister, you couldn't have you couldn't have run a business on video conferencing. And all of a sudden you could. So we managed through that. And then of course, the creation of effective vaccines in record time. Um, these are just tip of the iceberg of changes that are coming that I think are very positive. But that's long-term. Um, what gives me, look, I have a lot of worries short-term. I could go on about the economy. The other thing that gives me hope, long, once again, it's longer term for our societies, is that we are democracies. And I keep saying this, and I've been saying it for years. We're watching Xi Jinping go from COVID zero denial to COVID zero, and now back to COVID denial, disrupting supply chains, disrupting his economy. We are democracies. That's our strength is that, yeah, we'll get things so wrong all the time, but we will adapt and we will be resilient. So that's my hope. So one quick uh, follow-up. Naive globalism. Yeah. Are we still being naive when it comes to China? Because you saw the chancellor from Germany make a trip. You saw folks do all sorts of gymnastics to find a way of painting China as a rational actor and a partner and a co-traveler. Naive globalism. Yeah, no, it's not completely over. It's not completely over. We are there's still a lot of naivete. Mm -hmm. A lot of it, by the way, driven. I'll be very blunt about it. I've been blunt in Canada, driven by the corporate sector that has business interests, that it frankly profitability interests that it puts way ahead of any rational security concerns. And it's a problem in all of our Western countries. Um, you are a leader, even a conservative leader like myself trying to have a rational security oriented policy to China, you will have CEOs on the call on the phone telling you, you shouldn't be doing this. Um, and it's got nothing to do with anything, but their personal bottom lines. Um, frankly, reading talking points prepared by Beijing embassies. Um, so that's not completely done by the way, not completely done even on Russia. Um, I think that, um, in many Western capitals, um, you know, the, the, res the response continues to be, you know, how can we stop Putin from winning rather than what we, in my view, what we need to do is use this to inflict a historic and, and terminal defeat on him. Okay. I think that's possible, but, but once again, there's some hedging. So the era, the era you know, I think, I think 2022 is a division, but have we gone from, you know, complete... Uh, naivete to complete realism. No, we we were shifting a little bit and we've got a ways to go. Minister Payne. I wish I was, was still a minister, but uh, in the American tradition, I'm happy to be referred to that way, but it's, uh, oh, it's uh, <laughs> not the case so much in the Westminster system. Happily, I'm still a senator in my own parliament. Um, and Samir, thank you so much to uh, to you and to ORF America for the opportunity to, uh, to be here this afternoon uh, and to participate with uh, STEM colleagues uh, on uh, on this panel, I think uh, we still have our backs to the wall as far as 2022 is mm -hmm. uh, is concerned. Absolutely, and uh, Stephen uh, hits the nail on the head when he talks about the uh, global impact of the Russian invasion of of Ukraine mm -hmm. and the need to ensure that uh, I think we stand as one uh, in relation to uh, to that illegal and unlawful invasion of Ukraine. It, however, has. I think a multiplier effect that we could not possibly have imagined had we just taken in isolation uh, the behaviour of an authoritarian state uh, in invading another. But when you combine that with the impacts of a two-year global pandemic that has crushed economies and, uh, and shut countries down for that period of time and continues to have an extraordinary impact on things like labour availability um, and the state of their economies, when you combine that with the impact of the invasion on the world economy, uh, and particularly in relation to, to energy, uh, then I think we end 2022 very much with our backs against the wall. And certainly uh, Australia, the United States, countries across Europe dealing with inflation uh, in extraordinary terms. Uh, in Australia, uh, energy issues very front of mind, and we have a vexed history in uh, the climate uh, and energy uh, space, uh, and uh, one that is well known uh, globally. But notwithstanding that, uh, we've just taken an extraordinary step uh, in our country of effectively nationalising our gas sector, uh, which is uh, which is something that I think Australians are going to spend quite a bit of time coming to terms with when they realise its true implications uh, for our economy and our reputation as a global market. 
Um, and uh, that uh, all adds up to very difficult times ahead in 2023. So I'm searching for that piece of hope that you asked for, Samir. Uh, I'm looking for it. And I'm thinking I can find it in the broad consistency of uh, the international community uh, in support of Ukraine. And the fact that that has prevailed across calendar year 2022 and looks uh, looks seeming to do so into, into 2023. Um, we've all had the opportunity one way or another, whether it's through the magic of, uh, of online engagement, as, uh, as Stephen points out, all had the opportunity to see the leadership of President Zelensky and uh, his government, people like uh, Dmitry Kuleba, the foreign minister uh, in Ukraine, how they have advocated for their nation on the world stage, uh, taken every single opportunity to uh, to call on the world for support. Australia has uh, stepped up uh, both uh, through the period of my government and in the new government, I'm pleased to say. Uh, and I think it's essential to make the point that uh, that Stephen has made that to send the clearest possible message to Russia about uh, about the nature of this invasion, that that continues. And my hope for, for 2023 is to ensure that it doesn't need to last that long, that we can actually draw a line sooner rather than later. But I think it is immensely challenging for Ukraine. Um, I'm interested to, to see how the world responds to the humanitarian crisis, uh, because I think this gets much worse before it gets better. Uh, and deep concerns, as reported by UNICEF today, about the impact on children uh, in Ukraine. We know uh, what uh, the Russians are capable of, both in relation to women and to children, and I think that is something that um, we as an international community must have an ongoing eye on as well. Senator Payne, let me ask you uh, a blank question. Um, in uh, the, early, the first quarter of this year, you had a UNGA uh, vote on the Russian action. And you had a very large number of countries coming out and uh, condemning uh, Russia, standing up against the Russian uh, aggression. You had a smaller subset of those countries going on to sanction Russia. As the year progressed, how has support, global support, not European support, not support within the OECD, but the wider global community, how has that support changed through the year? And do you think there is a fatigue setting in and the world has other problems that they have to attend to? I think I mentioned some of those other problems in my response to, to your first question, but um, I, don't, I don't think it's at the point of, of global fatigue and I would be disappointed if, uh, if that was the case. Uh, I, I know, again, uh, from my own experience with the change of government, there are still, for example, a range of new sanctions being imposed uh, from from our perspective, and we encourage countries to use all the tools that they're about at their disposal uh, to send uh, to send a very clear message. But the price of global fatigue uh, would be a degree of acceptance of uh, such an unlawful unilateral act by an authoritarian state. And I don't think we can afford to uh, to come to that point. And it reminds me that I neglected to say, and you referred to uh, to China in your uh, in your opening remarks uh, that our bywords in relation to to China and again actions of an authoritarian state have to manifest in eternal vigilance mm -hmm. because if they don't manifest in internal vigilance where there are countries who are vulnerable uh, to um, coercion uh, then without the rest of us uh, maintaining that eternal vigilance, how are they ever supposed to withstand? So I do think uh, for countries like ours and, uh, and others that eternal vigilance is uh, also necessary. So Carl, let me come to you, uh, Prime Minister Merit. Uh, the mobilization that we've seen, the support that we are seeing in Europe and some parts of the world uh, for Ukraine and its efforts against Russia, will that mobilization be possible if China was to invade their world. I think it would, but of course, it's going to be a different game in that particular case. Uh, the legalities are going to be somewhat difficult, uh, and uh, that is going to be very much dependent upon what the Americans do. Because in much the same case as we've had here, um, it's been sort of the frontline states in Europe that's been the frontline of taking actions, and the rest of them supporting, including the Americans. In this particular case with Taiwan, it's going to be very much dependent on what to do, the, how far do the Americans go, how far do the Japanese go, how far do the Australians and others go. 
the Europeans don't have military might in uh, East Asia. Uh, so it's got to be it's got to be different. No question about that. How different is EU at the end of 2022? Has the power dynamics changed? Oh, oh, en <laughs> enormously different. Hmm. Enormously different. Um, I mean. <sighs> I don't think we need to understand the magnitude of this particular war. When I go around town here, I still get the feeling here that they don't really understand the magnitude of it. We have a front line of 1,300 kilometers. Front line of 1,300 kilometers. We have roughly a million men under arms. A million men under arms. We have roughly 15 million people who have been sort of forced to flee or been displaced. That's the by far biggest humanitarian catastrophe that we've had in the globe for decades. And this is only option. And then we have all of the effects on food and energy markets globally. Um, so it is it is a massive thing. What have we seen the EU doing? Um, well, stepping up, of course, support together with Americans. I mean, roughly, the figures are roughly $100 billion or euros, roughly 50-50, slightly more European than American at the moment, and others coming in, 13, 14, 15 million. Uh, huge shipments of military equipment, somewhat more American, e EU more financial. We've seen the EU adopting uh, instruments that were there for completely different purposes for these purposes. Just take one thing. Um, we set up, after immense discussions, uh, something called the European Peace Facility. Mm -hmm. um, that took quite a number of years to set up. Mm -hmm. What was that? That is that we, instead of uh, sending expeditionary forces to different parts of, say, Africa, we were deep financing what the Africans did in, for example, Somalia and other places. So we were financing de facto sort of the African peacekeeping, African conflict resolution mechanism. All of that money, we have tripled the money for that, and all of it, so to say, has gone to buying arms for Ukraine. I mean, had anyone said this one year ago, they would have been considered insane. Um, so we are in a long-term, very major military conflict that will, uh, the outcome of which will uh, affect Europe, not only for months and years, but for decades to come. The entire political order between sort of the River Vistula and the River Volga is going to change. If you ask me how, I have ideas, but I don't know. But it's all going to change. And that's going to affect not only global politics, but also European politics in very fundamental ways. And how are the dynamics between Berlin and Paris on the one hand, and Berlin and Paris and the rest of Europe on the other hand? I don't, that, I don't think that has affected that much um, uh, as of yet. I mean, that's been a rock, remarkable cohesion among the European countries. There is, at the moment, there's an element of tension between France and, and between Berlin and Paris, but it's not related to these issues. Um, there's been, of course, somewhat more of a tendency by the French to uh, place uh, calls to the Kremlin and see if anything can be achieved and make a press release out of that. Um, <laughs> but that's sort of, that's, that's a national sport um, <laughs> that they have. Uh, the Germans have been doing the same with roughly the same result. Uh, and uh, the thing that's going to happen in the longer term um, will be, is a shift in EU towards the center and the east of Europe. Um, mm. Also in terms of military power. I mean, the, uh, the German army at the end of this, with a huge increase in military spending, is going to be substantially bigger than the French army and substantially bigger than the UK army. So the military balance of forces it's not that we are supposed to fight each other, by the way, but the, insofar as the relative size of the military forces have a political effect, it does have to some extent, that's going to change. And Poland going for 3% of GDP defense spending, they talk about 4%, I don't think that's going to happen. But even 3% of the Polish economy, with the success of the Polish economy, is uh, they are now importing everything they can import from the rest of the world, primarily Korea at the moment, because it turns out the Korean arms industry can deliver faster than we can produce either in America or in Europe. That's generally true of everything. Uh, 
I think that's generally true of everything. Korea can produce most things faster than you can produce in Europe or America. But but let me turn to uh, Dr. El Kebri. At the start, let me ask you, sitting in the Middle East, lots happening there. Uh, of course, the Football World Cup, but the World Cup itself has become in some sense a uh, uh, arena of new negotiations, diplomacy, um, you know, rapprochement in some sense. Uh, but more importantly, um, in many ways, uh, the Middle East is back in the news for different reasons. Uh, you know, energy has a new salience again. And um, lots of money in that particular region, lots of investments, lots of infrastructure, lots of uh, new directions that uh, countries are exploring at this particular point of time. It's a very busy place. Sitting there, how do you look at this conflict in Europe? And um, how do you assess sometimes the degree of uh, disdain that is uh, uh, cast uh, uh, in the Eastern Hemisphere when they are not equally enthusiastic about uh, being mobilized uh, by others in this new European conflict? Well, thanks, Amir. And uh, also, I'm uh, glad and proud to be part of the ORF success. Well, it, you cannot look at Europe at all, what's happening in the world, which is also affecting our region. And if I will add to the question, what Jane said, we are uh, witnessing since what we call it, strategic shocks since the Trump's came. And, and then we have the pandemic, then we have uh, the Ukraine uh, war. Now, what is next? What will be the other strategic shocks which we are going uh, to witness? This is uh, the question. And, and we have this, which is, has an impact on the world order, okay? Uh, and of course, the, the, the influx, on the on the on that level, <coughs> national level, also it's an impact on our um, region now. Looking to what's happening now, I won't say it's uh, a European crisis now. This is becoming a, a, a global uh, a crisis because the impact and the consequences goes beyond Europe, and uh, in terms of food security, uh, energy. Uh, security, and, and, and many other uh, things now. How we, do we look in the uh, Middle East? Sometimes we look at such the double standards from, from the Western to our region, because also we had, it's not just uh, uh, with all respect what's happening in Ukraine, but in our region also, we have many dead bodies have Yemen, Syria, and, and, and Palestine area, and many of our region, but it did not get any attention from the other, I mean, from Europe, from, from United States. And when, when it comes to uh, Ukraine crisis, and we are talking about the energy, here also we find some, I would say it's hypocrisy. Because before that, if you remember, we have been asked, and let's talk about the Gulf, okay, to reduce our uh, or, or stop pumping our oil because of that climate change. And now just for a sudden, this climate change has disappeared. Come, we are also blamed why we are not pumping more oil because of that, that, that Europe needs our uh, oh, yeah. So this also kind of make our the people in our region, Gulf region, thinking, okay, let us think about our national interest. What is good for the United States, what's good for Europe, it doesn't mean it's good for us. Well, let us see what is our national interest, and this is the priority for us, because also, we are only oil-based cannon. And when you stop pumping that oil, it means you cannot feed your people. This influx now in the money, but this is, doesn't mean it will last forever. So also you have to diversify your uh, economy and it's, it's the chances is very tight because uh, you are not like Europe or others, where you have 
uh, agriculture, we have tourists, we have uh, uh, other things. Now, how you take your place in this all what's happening uh, in the world? When we deal with Europe, Carl men mentioned something, but also we have a, a buzzing because European comes individual to deal with this. Okay, now look to uh, energy. Okay, they don't come as EU. And when they want to deal with us, they're telling us you have to become as a, a GCC together. And, and this is also bustling us, the conflict between France and Italy, between France and Germany, and this competition between them also uh, uh, make us confused. Okay, we deal with EU or we deal with each country uh, alone. Uh, and also they are approaching us, they're approaching UAE or Saudi, or Qatar or siding with, with the, uh, others. This is also make us cannot deal with which country of EU is, I say Germany, we have a good relation. France, we have good relation. But with EU, EU as EU, we don't have that. Yeah. Because always we have been accused by EU, but others are the, I mean, look to Germany, they came and asked. For the for the gas and oil, but the EU status accusing us. We are not siding. That, by that's Russia. A good point. We are that's... not siding by Russia, by the way, because they are accusing us siding by Russia. We are not siding by Russia, but we have interest with Russia, right? And and we are uh, we took that position in in United Nations, but you have to exchange your interest. When it comes you to your interest, your interest is the priority. That's a good point, Carl. Uh, when uh, you want to be realist, you are independent countries. When you want to be woke, you decide to become EU. That's the <laughs> that's that's the accusation thrown at you. No, not really. Yeah, I mean I can understand it, but I mean there, there's this difference. I mean you are correct. Uh, the EU relationship with the country has always been somewhat complicated in the sense that EU's where EU has power is trade. Uh, we, we, there it is a sort of a, a connect as a nation state and relationship with the EU and the GCC has been very complicated primarily I would say because the GCC has been rather complicated to put it in the mildest possible forms so so the that relationship has gone has been a very difficult one EU doesn't have any competence for selling weapons there you have the French and the Brits and others competing with the Gulf states quite a lot um, so you have to, Europe is a complicated machine. And so we have the competence on the European level and we have the competence on the national level. It can be confusing, but I mean, that's the division that is there. Uh, uh, you know, let me turn to Prime Minister Ahab. Prime Minister Ahab of the region, the Middle East, uh, West Asia, more broadly. It's changing. And you've been engaging with this region for a long time now. So what are the new trends uh, that you visualize as being uh, for good. How is well, that changing? Well, look, um, the the most positive trend by far, um, you know, is what happened in I'm trying to remember now if it's 2020, 2021 around the Abraham Accords. Mm -hmm. um, but it was more it's more than a peace between Israel and a number of Arab states. What it really is symbolic of is a number of Arab states. UAE being the leader, but frankly, the Saudis and others not far behind saying, um, we, you know, our future is not as a uh, purveyor of fundamentalist Islam. It's actually as a force of modernization mm -hmm. against that kind of a philosophy emanating from what is, of course, the worst trend in the region is the government of Iran. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you're having it. I, I spent a lot of time in the Gulf and Saudi Arabia, UAE, and, and I mean, the forces of modernization, we, we do not appreciate in this part of the world, people simply do not appreciate the degree, the, the pace of modernization and thought, commerce, society that is happening in that part of the world. Saudi Arabia has experienced in the last five years, 
probably the most rapid social change of any society in human history. And it's all positive. It's all positive. Unfortunately, that's not being that's conveyed right. to our uh, publics. Uh, Senator Payne, Pacific Islands. I'm, I'm going to the nice places in the, around the world. <laughs> Solomon's Choice, as they call it. Mm -hmm. What's happening there? In the Pacific? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think there's strong engagement uh, in the Pacific, uh, clearly on, on global climate priorities, and that has been long the case for, uh, for very good reason. We had worked with them through Pacific Island Forum declarations uh, from uh, the Boy Declaration uh, out of Nauru to Kanaki 2 out of Tuvalu, uh, and then the most recent uh, declaration out of Fiji, which identifies, uh, which identifies that. They are the forefront of uh, the impact of uh, extreme weather events so often. Uh, that um, is something that we have strong regional focus on, particularly for resilience uh, and climate adapted, climate um, uh, resilient infrastructure, uh, and uh, and making sure that uh, that our Pacific friends also have the chance to participate in what can be very expensive undertakings to be part of the global discussion uh, on uh, on these on things, all, these, on all and, of these issues. And how does China figure out that? Uh, what is the new role of China in that region? Why is that disquiet? I was reading an article today that New Zealand wants to now become part of a new BRI arrangement, uh, the Pacific beachhead of, of China's uh, uh, infrastructure and connectivity project. Is there some political undercurrents uh, in that particular part of the world that we are not sensing? Uh, well, I think that they're, they're reasonably... Uh, open uh, in terms of, um, I'm not sure there are undercurrents actually. I think there is. Yeah, okay. um, it's, it's part of the strategic competition that we uh, that we see every day, uh, and competition for for influence uh, included. Uh, and from Australia's perspective, uh, we have uh, always welcomed uh, investment, for example, in infrastructure that is that is open and transparent, that doesn't add to the debt burden of, of companies with uh, of countries with struggling economies, uh, that is uh, the sort of infrastructure that the countries themselves seek, and that's not always been the case. Uh, so what we do uh, and what our like-minded uh, friends do, Canada, for example, has reached further into, uh, into the region uh, in recent years, including um, under the current administration indicating the opening of a high commission in Fiji, for example, which I think is a work in progress. Uh, there, there is a great deal of interest from, uh, from Europe, from France, from Germany, from the Netherlands, um, many countries of engaging further across the Pacific, and that is warmly welcomed uh, because it shows uh, a broader global interest but also a broader global commitment uh, to strategic security and certainty. So I'm going to open this up for all of you to come in. Uh, we can take a few questions. I can see your hand already at the back of the room. But I would welcome all of you to come in. And if you have uh, uh, questions for our panelists, please do post them. I can. Uh, and do do introduce yourself, brief introduction, and uh, a brief question. So I have four hands here. So can we gather a few of them together? Let's take three of them at a time. So go ahead. Thank you. My name is Sanjeev Joshipur. I work for in diaspora. We are a nonprofit organization that is a, an agglomeration of Indian diaspora leaders from around the world in various countries. My question is for Prime Ministers Bilt and Harper and uh, Foreign Minister Payne. And my question is as follows, depending on which political party is in power in your respective country, do you detect a merely a tonal change in China policy, or do you detect a substantive change in China policy? Thank you. Great. Uh, I saw a hand here. Go ahead. There are also a couple of hands. Hi, uh, my name is Gaurav. Uh, I am a student at Georgetown University and uh, also interning with Albright Stonebridge Group. Um, my question is with respect to um, global challenges and global governance. Um, uh, especially with respect to public goods. Uh, Mr. Harper uh, mentioned that 2022 has been the year of division. One casualty has been that unilateralism and plurilateralism has sort of replaced uh, internationalism in some ways. A couple of days back, we saw the US um, 
showing no signs of complying with a WTO ruling, which in no ways is new, but something that's uh, increasingly be becoming uh, normal. So the question is, is plurilateralism and unilateralism going to continue uh, to dominate over internationalism over the next couple of years, or can there be rules uh, that countries can agree with? Thanks, thanks, Karan. And David, and then we'll come here to the gentleman at the front. Or, or you can come here to the gentleman at the front, and then we'll go to David. Bye. Yeah, thanks. Alden Meyer from E3G. Fascinating discussion. Uh, in 2022, we had a new word enter the lexicon, the poly crisis, uh, because we not only saw the war in Ukraine, we saw the exacerbation of food security, energy price shock, climate change on steroids. Just look at Pakistan experiencing 30 to 40 billion dollars of damage with only a few hundred million on offer from the West to help. Uh, we saw the pandemic not letting up too much. Uh, in 2008, when we had the last global economic crisis, the G20 stepped in, and you might think they didn't do everything right, uh, but they stabilized the situation. Is there a committee to save the world now? Is it the G20 under India? And if not, who is it? David, final question for this round. Thank you for all that cooperation, though. I just yeah. said cooperation is not dead. Um, yeah, and there's been crisis inflation. Now. I think we're on multi crisis next. And and mega crisis. I'm David Victor. I'm UC San Diego and also on the ORF America board. A question for the panel really about China, building on the first question. Seems like the only area of bipartisan consensus in this town is to be super tough on China. And I'm just curious, how, to what degree is the panel worried about that carrying itself too far? And what do we do to avoid in a place like ORF America getting sucked into the kind of vortex of hyper anti-Chinese uh, interest? Great. So we have four questions. Uh, do Does the tone change or does the policy change? Prime Minister Harper, Prime Minister Bill, uh, Senator P. Change of party? So in, in terms of China, the policy changed radically when my government changed. Um, I had a, a, you know, we considered China's security threat long term. We did engage economically, but we were careful with our engagement, and of course, we also viewed them as a as a competitor on values. When the Trudeau government came to office, they ceased to view China as a security threat at all. In fact, they reversed the number of national security restrictions my government had on Chinese investment. They uh, tried to launch free trade negotiations with China, which, even though I had signed almost all Canada's free trade agreements, we decided not to do, and um, and they, you know, did basically uh, uh, diplomatic outreach. Now, they learned a very series of very hard lessons along the way. And as of this year, they're pretty well, in fact, they're now probably tougher on China than I actually was because they so misjudged it. But so that was a real substantive difference. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Um, the short answer to that question would be no, it doesn't change that much with the change of government. Uh, to that should, of course, be added that in Europe, there's an EU machinery. I mean, we have a constant dialogue. And see, the last three summit meetings of EU leaders, China has been on the agenda for all three of them. Um, so we have tried to elaborate strategies and policy responses together. Um, that could be nuances between the different countries, as we've seen, um, but nothing that fundamental, I would say. And then there's an evolution of policies, needless to say. But that's something that we try to do together. I think it's an interesting question, and I think I would invert your uh, your premise because sometimes it's uh, not necessarily about whether there's a tonal change between party representations in countries like Canada or Australia or Sweden. It's about whether um, perhaps um, those in China think they can take advantage of changes, um, whether their approach or tone changes, not necessarily that. So domestically in Australia, um, uh, there's some contestability in the politics, but there's contestability in almost every aspect of politics you can identify in Australia. It's a very robust democracy. Uh, so there is a little bit of contestability in the politics and uh, and perhaps uh, the manner. Um, but what we have what we what remains to be seen um, after a change in government only six or seven months ago uh, is whether China's approach changes. So uh, will we see? Uh, an end to the instances of arbitrary detention of Australians? Uh, will we see a change in the economic, in the extreme economic coercion and trade 
uh, coercion placed on uh, on Australian business? Uh, will we see a uh, change in attitude uh, which which stemmed from a number of incidences, but, for example, Australia's decisions on 5G uh, in 2018? What change will we see from, uh, from China's so, so, side? Maybe, sorry to interrupt you, but maybe you could take David's question as well. David uh, poses the question that, is there a fear that we are going to take uh, uh, anti-China rhetoric too far? And since you've been at the receiving end of uh, China's measures, how do you respond to that worry? That are we going too far in, in creating the monster? So, uh, well, I, I, don't, I don't subscribe to the view of creating uh, the monster. And I think it's extremely important to identify when we are speaking publicly the difference between the Chinese people uh, and the CCP. Uh, between uh, the approach that uh, the government of the CCP takes uh, and uh, and that of the the vast populace of the Chinese people, let alone the extraordinarily valuable uh, Chinese Australian diaspora, for example, uh, the Australian Chinese diaspora in Hong Kong, for example, uh, which make an extraordinary contribution and have, have historically made an extraordinary contribution to the development of our country, uh, and one which. Uh, we have recognised uh, consistently from uh, from my side of politics. I'd also say uh, in making these uh, observations, of course, China is Australia's largest trading partner, and that continues to be the case. Uh, but that does not negate uh, the steps which were taken um, against us and which um, a, a glib a glib journalist or a, uh, or a glib uh, commentator might say can be changed uh, in the change of the government. Well, so far, that would not seem to be the case. So, so Prime Minister Harper, you were an internationalist. There was a question here. That is, the days of internationalism over. Are we really looking at club lateralism, club of countries getting together and, and trying to work together on certain issues? Uh, perhaps... Uh, Short answer is, I think, yes. Mm -hmm. um, as I say, especially with what happened in 2022 with the invasion and now the... I want to say the full polarization, but part of partial polarization of the world. Um, you know, we're, I say we're in a Cold War. Um, we're in a, a contest of, of wills and might. And I'm not saying the rules-based order is going to disappear entirely, but increasingly it's going to be a matter of alliances and effective actions. Mm -hmm. um, that's really going to be the order of the day. Dr. Ipsum? Well, I think regionalism, you will find more a club of countries working uh, together. But uh, I would say I would like to add or to say something about China, uh, especially in the light of Z, uh visit to, 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 to the Gulf and how the Gulf also looks to, to China. And um, well, the, the Gulf does not look to China as a threat, okay? Rather than an uh, economic partner and uh, still the security and, and uh, strategic partner is the United States uh, mainly, but with China, they exchange more uh, when we talked about diversifying their uh, economic relation. And uh, the Chinese are offering uh, more, but they did not do like the European or the, the Sri Lankan, where um, complete ports are run by, by the, the Chinese. They learned that, okay? Uh, they will, when compared to security, of course, still the, the security umbrella would, would then I said, but if you will, will ask them whom to choose, uh, of course, they will choose their security. But as the Saudi and the Christian monitor the article today, that mostly the Saudi said, okay, you cannot be an ally for no long years. And once somebody is uh, describing you as a parent, and this is not the kind of the relation which we don't find it with the Chinese, okay? Kind of respect is there. Uh, well, somebody will argue because they are both autocrats and, and, and so, well, I won't say like, like 
the, the, our um, free trade with EU, it took 30 years. And just on the line, she said in Manama Dialogue, just, just uh, last month, that we are going to sign this. What happened? Because of their need of energy. This is what I'm saying. This is double standard. The other thing, what she said also, and the German state minister said about Iran, that Iran now is a threat. Just, uh, uh, just one, you know, one time they discovered that Iran is a threat and the ballistic missile is the threat and the Gulf is talking to you that these ballistic missiles, these drones are a threat. Now when it reached to Europe home, they found that it is a threat to this kind of of when you are talking, like with China. Well, yes, it have dealing with China, current Europe, and only accusing the Gulf is when they are dealing with China and they have to stop their relation with China. Well, you are wanting to come in. I can see. No, I'm, I'm not aware that we've been accusing the Gulf states of sort of being close to China. I think that's been more here in town, yeah. uh, that sentiment has been. Yeah. Uh, we had perhaps some questions on the Xi Jinping uh, romance with the Saudis, uh, what's the content of it, um, but uh, more questions than exclamation marks. But let me say just one remark on the other bigger question, where is the word heading, you know, pluralism, things like that. No question, we have a major crisis of multilateralism. Uh, at this, so we have on the one side today, fairly obviously, we have a rise in geopolitical tension. War in Europe, China, whatever, rise in geopolitical tension, undermining the prospects for any sort of meaningful global cooperation. This happens at the same time as we have a dramatic rise in the need for global cooperation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been very much involved with the World Health Organization trying to help them to coordinate the pandemic response. And I've learned a lot, I have to say. I've learned a lot about the nature of the sort of biological threat that are out there. Uh, in the future, that could hit us anytime, anywhere, mm -hmm. and which is a really doesn't respect very much of borders at all. And it's only by working together, everyone, including the Russians and Chinese and all dubious people, Danes and whatever. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> let, let <laughs> me <laughs> see. Regional rivalry comes in. That's a historic <laughs> rivalry. And, 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 and the, the other one, of course, is climate change. Um, which we've seen, Pakistan was mentioned as an example, but we could have numerous other examples. When I was in India last week, they pointed out to me that in India, there's one thing every day uh, that is now happening. We don't see it in the media, but it's happening all the time. And there we have also the problem with the Chinese. They are 27% of global emissions. Um, and uh, really their use of coal and others using coal is sort of, the crux of the map. No, so let me ask you a more direct question. Can multilateralism work in a multipolar world uh, when you don't have a strong America underwriting its functioning? It has to. And how will it, how will it work? Well, it has to. Uh, I mean, take the climate. Uh, we can only work together. I mean, either we work together or we fail. Mm. I mean, it's, it's fairly simple from that point of view. Mm. Uh, we, we can do limited things. I mean, we Europeans can be extremely ambitious of what we do, and we are trying to do that. That's fine, but we have a fairly small part of emissions. Uh, so it doesn't really, I mean, of course it helps, and we should do it. Uh, but we need to have the big emissions. So for that. example, the European Border Adjustment Mechanism, yeah. uh, Border Tax, Carbon Tax. Well, yeah, yeah, right. That's a unilateral measure. How is, how is it multilateral? You've decided that rich countries will uh, will now tax carbon and prevent development options for a poorer country. How is it multilateral? Yeah, but the... the other, it, it, that is in order to prevent carbon leakage, because we are thinking extremely, it was necessary. I mean, the, just briefly on that one. Yeah, quite. <laughs> what, what, what we do is, of course, we impose very heavy costs on European industry. Uh, say to be produce item X is going to be very much more expensive in Europe because of emissions. Then it would not be sustainable if we allow the same thing to be imported from a country that's doing it without that particular 
measures taken. Yes, uh, so, uh, so point is, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, questioning the efficacy of the measure. I'm just saying that there was hardly any consultation around the measure. Oh, they so were. it was not, it was not a multilateral. Oh, oh they were. Uh, but, I'm, I'm, I mean, uh, no one spoke to us in this part of the world. Where, where we require energy to grow. So I'm just telling you that that I understand what you're trying to do. I'm not uh, questioning the efficacy, but I'm just questioning the multilateral character of that move. But but uh, to the point of the gentleman here, where is the committee who's going to solve these problems? You, he, the question was that in 2008, G20 threw a few trillion dollars to try and save the financial system. Where is that group of countries today who are willing? I think that was the question that he was. Yeah. Where is the group of countries today, Prime Minister Harper? Well, so I, I want to, in a way, disagree with Carl. I, I just, I, oh, I, 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 hope, I hope Carl's right. I hope that the necessity of tackling these problems together, at least in, in isolated spheres, will cause that kind of global cooperation. But I, I see no guarantee that it will. And, you know, I constantly draw. Uh, the distinction between the experience I had when I was prime minister during the global financial crisis, two months after the crisis began, George W. Bush had us all in the White House, all the leaders of the major economies, international financial institutions. And in a couple of days, we drafted a comprehensive, the framework of a comprehensive global approach. And all the countries, governments, central banks, we stayed in constant mm -hmm. contact, notwithstanding how different that crisis affected our economies. The pandemic, where frankly, pandemics affect all human beings the same, there never was global cooperation of any significance. There never was a meeting of leaders at any point. There was a, a war over oil supply. There was a war over personal protective equipment. There was a war over vaccines. I thought the most amazing thing was that we were, you know, two years, for two years after the pandemic, we had across the world, not just between countries, but within countries all these various travel restrictions. Mm -hmm. And not only did we never develop any protocols or metrics around these things, nobody even suggested it. There wasn't a single world leader even suggested we do such a thing. So I hope you're right. But boy, if the pandemic is, uh, is, uh, is an it's example, we're right. in real trouble in terms of global cooperation. Right. I, I hope I'm right as well, but I hope so. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I we have run out of time. Uh, I I do have to finish because we have a five thirty engagement, uh, and uh, uh, I, I think uh, we've had a great debate. There are lots of questions, of course, that have been provoked by many of your responses. Uh, but it would be fair to end this uh, particular year uh, with the with something that Prime Minister Harper just mentioned that in the long year that we have lived through, which began somewhere in the beginning of 2020 and continues till now, a long year, uh, one long year, uh, we have seen uh, America largely missing in action. China perhaps implicated in it some of the things that have gone wrong and other countries trying to scramble to save themselves. Uh, that is the state of in the international order uh, that we are in many ways uh, carrying forward to 2023. And I hope it changes in 2023. Uh, there is some, um, uh, obviously, optimism around countries rallying together, regional groups uh, collaborating more strongly, uh, clubs emerging that will solve specific problems, uh, and hopefully uh, in, in not dissimilar to the internet, perhaps networked groups of partnerships could create a larger collective that could respond more effectively. Hopefully, we could resemble the internet in its chaos and still come up with something that is more direct, efficient, and functional. And maybe that is the future of internationalism. But please join me in applauding the panel for their wonderful interventions this evening. And, uh, and before we end, let me invite the, the chairperson of uh, ORF America, Mr. Sanjay Joshi, to, such, to say a few words. Uh, Mr. Joshi, please. Uh, well, this is basically a big thank you First of all, to our panelists uh, for that amazing discussion we've had. This is not a, a conversation which is going to be easily forgotten. Uh, we've been meeting I, you know, in person after a very long time, two to three years almost. And really, this is our America's first function of this nature. You know, when everyone's got together. It was lovely meeting you all online. We love meeting all of you on Zoom. Uh, but being here in person, interacting with each and every one of you, 
uh, gives a completely different flavor. So here we are in the middle of the festive season. Uh, this is a time when you want to be with family, you want to be with friends. And therefore, we decided that this was the right time uh, to be here in DC with friends, so many known faces around you all, for whom I'm, I'm seeing after a long time. A great time to be with friends to actually present uh, this pandemic baby of ours. It was born during the pandemic. <laughs> Uh, it learned to crawl during the pandemic. It was, it was, it made sure that even during the pandemic, it was not a quiet child. It made a lot of noise, even if it did it on Zoom. And you know, somewhere along the way during the pandemic, the baby learned to stand. A new address started appearing on Google Maps, where you are located now, North West Street. So this address started. People started hearing about it, and publications have started coming out. Uh, and thanks to the amazing work done by Thua, Sharon, who you know, cobbled together, built up this team, and created uh, this entire structure. Uh, so a big thank you to all our uh, board members, our advisors, Prime Minister Harper, Prime Minister Bilge, uh, Senator Payne, Ipsam, David, Jane, all of you for standing by us uh, during this difficult time and helping us uh, create this organization and reach where it is, you know. So now it is uh, what this is. This yeah, I call it the pandemic. It was born in a troubled time, a very very difficult time, and it is now, as you can see through the discussions, shaping itself to engage with the U.S. India partnership, to engage with the world, and manage what is an actually extremely complex relationship. I speak here of the bilateral relationship between India and the US itself, or between various other countries. Now, we are also trying to do something where we talk of the India US partnership. It is a complex partnership. Complex because it has to be a partnership that must manage a very changing international order, which, as you just heard from Pandas, with each passing day getting more and more complicated. So there are times when we will need to continue to kind of uh, mitigate our differences and uh, strengthen the convergences between us, between us as nations, between us as peoples. DC, of course, has had a long tradition of scholars attached to different institutes working on India and on the partnership. And, uh, we are, this is not just another uh, flavor we are adding to it. It's not just another uh, chicken tikka shop masala down the corner. Uh, or if America is, is, is not that. So, you know, indeed, India, uh, OR of America does add an Indian flavor uh, to an already very strong American purpose and resolve uh, to India's aspirations. But OR of America really aims to bring in voices, not just from India. That is not what we intend to do. So this is not OR of India in America. It is not that. So what OR of America wants to do, it kind of hopes to work in concert with other partners uh, and explore new domains and new geographies. I find it no coincidence uh, that our presence here today coincides with the US-Africa Leader Summit. It's taking place at the same time. Now, there are new domains and new geographies where we need to, if we have a partnership going ahead, we need to work together. West Asia, you know, what is happening in West Asia? What is happening in the Indo-Pacific, all topics which we discussed here uh, right in this panel. So what if America is here to contribute to the blueprint of this new global cooperative uh, framework, which is, I think, extremely necessary under the new emerging alignments and the new arrangements which are taking place across the world. So in the festive season, it presents itself as a venue for, I would say, a festival of ideas. And uh, being who we are, and here I speak of, of both India and the United States. Uh, we are noisy democracies. We have a lot of clutter and we have a lot of clutter. That is the way we are. And as uh, Stephen, uh, you said very correctly, you know, th this is what democracy is. We find directions through misdirection. So all of America, yes, continues to do that in that you know, clutter and clatter. There are uh, residing some of the most creative minds, some of the most minds which prosper under these circumstances. And who will 
kind of sync the differences and bring the diversity of these two countries and use the diversity of these two countries to actually find solutions to this complex process. So as our of America starts taking these strides, I thank you all for being with us, our board members, our entire, everyone who's here in this room and those who will be joining us online from time to time. I thank you all uh, for stepping in, coming in and making this possible. We will be back again, time, time again. Thank you.